Thank you so much, Dr. Currier. This has been fantastic. And our last talk today <clears throat> is on, on long COVID clinical trials. And we're really honored to have with us uh, Dr. Kanisha Simmerman. Dr. Simmerman is an associate professor of pediatrics at Duke University. She is uh, she's in the division of, of uh, critical care medicine, and she completed her PhD in pharmacoepidemiology at UNC. She's a recipient of the Duke CTSA Career Development Award, and she her research focuses on improving safety of drugs administered to critically ill children. So uh, thank you, Dr. Simmerman. She, you, she is one of the persons leading many of the research studies in, in, in COVID and, and long COVID, and we're really excited to have you with us. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I've spent a while in clinical trials, which is while I've, uh, why I kind of landed in this position at DCRI and, and um, helping to lead some of these things. But um, really would like to share with you today some of the challenges and opportunities that we, uh, that we have moving forward with regard to, to um, clinical trials. Um, so I just have one financial disclosure related to the Biogen Foundation supporting a summer research training program. After this talk, I'm, I'm really hopeful that you can have some understanding of the challenges that are really associated with designing trials for um, long COVID. Um, but also, uh, hopefully, you feel encouraged um, by understanding the breadth of the National Institutes of Health effort to address long COVID through clinical trials. So many of you are likely familiar with these concepts that I will talk about over the next um, couple of slides, but I think it's really important to, as you're sitting down and thinking about how to design clinical trials, I think there's some really fundamental things that we need to make sure that we're covering, generally speaking, when we're designing these clinical trials. So, you know, we want to make sure that there's an important and well-defined clinical problem. There are enough people who are affected so you can actually enroll. It has high burden, like morbidity or mortality, and that we have you know, an adequate understanding of the pathophysiology. Um, we also really like to have an identified intervention that's directed specifically potentially at the pathophysiology or maybe specific symptomatology, um, ideally supported by preliminary data. And then if this, uh, this therapy or intervention is, is proven to be successful, you want to uh, hopefully, it would be widely available or accessible um, after the trial is done so that people can actually benefit from the results that you are, are have gotten. Um, we want to make sure that we have clinically meaningful and well-defined endpoints so we can actually define success. Um, this comes with you know, testable hypotheses, and we want to have a well-defined target population. So you've heard a lot about long COVID over the course of the day. Um, you know, certainly we know that it's an important and well, uh, it's important and well-defined clinical problem. We know that it affects millions of people worldwide. Uh, we know that there are devastating consequences. So it certainly takes care of this idea of morbidity and even mortality in some cases. However, the underlying pathophysiology remains somewhat poorly understood. Thankfully, we're learning more and more about that, but it's still, there's still a lot of questions. Um, we've also heard about kind of the variety and heterogeneity of symptoms that may come and go after COVID-19. Um, and then these questions that, that are lingering still about whether or not things like cognitive dysfunction and long COVID are the same, is the same as, as other diseases. And if so, like which ones does it mirror? And then things like what defines and causes exercise intolerance in the setting of long COVID is um, EI or exercise intolerance in long COVID the same? Are we really defining exercise intolerance is the same as post-exertional malaise? Like all of these questions have been um, have arisen as, as we've been thinking about the clinical trials. Um, we want to make sure that there's an identified intervention, ideally that's directed at known pathophysiology or again, uh, symptomatology. We do have prior information about post-viral syndromes, but there's limited data about efficacy of prior interventions and whether or not the pathophysiology here is the same as the pathophysiology in, in other post-viral syndromes. And Dr. Prada has talked a little bit about that in one of his comments earlier today. Clinically meaningful and well-defined endpoints. This is really key and really important. So in thinking about long COVID, COVID clinical trials, you really want to think about what type of measure should we actually be, be using? Is there a performance-based measure, a patient-reported outcome, a biomarker, or other objective tests? Do we have those things? Do we have the information? Do we have the data to actually convince us that one of these things is going to be um, meaningful? You have also likely heard today that um, you know a lot in a lot of the circumstances where patients have 
um, symptoms of long COVID and we would diagnose them with long COVID, a lot of the measures that we would typically use, particularly performance-based outcome measures or other like biomarkers, et cetera, may not be abnormal. And then the question is like, which measure? Is this like a global impression of change, for example? Like, are we just generally interested in like quality of life from the beginning to the end of a trial? Is it gonna be symptom specific? And then because people have a wide constellation of symptoms, which symptom are we actually targeting? And then does a known symptom measure, like a, a patient reported outcome, for example, have the same performance in those with long COVID um, and those who have, and, and similar symptoms? So something that measures like cognitive dysfunction, like a promise measure, for example, is it, does it perform the same in patients with long COVID as it does in patients with um, kind of mild cognitive dysfunction, you know, early Alzheimer's, et cetera? These are the questions and the things that we've really grappled with over the course of the last, last year or so as designing the clinical trials. So you've heard some about Recover earlier and, and have seen some of the data um, coming from the Recover cohorts, which has been um, really fantastic. Recover in general is a patient-centered, integrated, adapted research network where there are a number of questions that are trying to be answered. And then hopefully, what are the treatments um, for uh, both prevention and those people who actually have disease? How do we actually um, make things better? Um, as far as how Recover works, you know, there's a lot, there are a lot of inputs. There's people that are contributing to this effort. There's um, a lots of information about clinical science and pathobiology and autopsy studies, et cetera, real world data coming from the EMR. We just heard some information about how real world data can be very helpful and then clinical trials. Over the course of the last uh, couple of years, Recover has really made some substantial progress. Um, we've re we, the global we, and the people who have been running and uh, tirelessly running a lot of these um, studies prior to initiation of the clinical trials have really characterized a, a cohort of long COVID patients, um, have really um, gotten a lot of insight on prevalence, risk factors, impacts, and disparities from the EHR. And there's been opportunities to compare real world to EHR information. Um, there's been robust longitudinal characterization of long COVID patients who so following them over time. Uh, there's been a lot of information to really uh, characterize the pathophysiology of long COVID. And the next frontier is really um, to move into these five platform protocols that will form the basis for clinical trials. And I'll tell you about those in the next couple of um, slides. All right. So um, this recovered clinical trial development and design has been um, really a labor of love by many, many people. Um, we've had patients and regulatory agents. Um, we've had clinical researchers um, and other government agencies that have really um, had a lot of thought and input into uh, what we should be studying, how we should be studying it. Um, and what the outcomes and things should be. The recovered cohort data has been very informative to identify things that have been symptomatology that's been very prominent um, within patients and therefore our targets for making sure that we can identify interventions. We have had a lot of patient input. Um, patients have told us about their symptoms. They've told us about interventions that they are interested in and have really helped us to think a lot about other cloud uh, trial concepts. We've also worked some with industry to try to form public-private partnerships um, and make sure that we are all really thinking about this together. Um, you know, in thinking about which interventions are prioritized, it's not only um, people and having information about, you know, what people have done in the past, where's there been preliminary data, what diseases are similar, and how might we use the data and information that we have to test some interventions in a new disease process. So that's really um, part of what we've been thinking about. We want to make sure that outcomes, et cetera, are fit for purpose in this particular population. So more about the patient community engagement, which is really, I think, a unique factor and a unique feature of um, Recover. I'm like really proud of um, the opportunity and the potential to do this even better in the future. Um, the patients and patient advocates and community representatives have been part of the PASC Intervention Prioritization Committee. So they have uh, talked a lot about the burden of disease, um, 
cost and you know insurance coverage or lack thereof, adverse effects, and and really participated on um, deliberations and prioritizing the past interventions. They've also suggested therapies or interventions that they've seen themselves that they've been part of as part of their therapeutic um, you know relationships with their physicians and that they have been uh, privy to as part of the long COVID community. There was also a process um, whereby uh, people put in um, recommendations or uh, proposed interventions. This was um, a, a CT ROA process or research opportunity announcement by the NIH. Um, and uh, people put in their proposals and patients participated in um, reviewing those proposals, uh, making sure that people had been thoughtful about being patient um, focused in their, their clinical trial designs. And then they've also been part of the protocol development. So we've had protocol development working groups where patients and patient representatives and advocates have been part of those groups as well. I believe the impact of patient experience on clinical trial development really has been, I think, rich and great. And it's been, I think, just speaking for myself as someone who's been leading this effort, not only globally, but also um, in charge of one of the clinical trials in particular, having the patient voice there has been um, really, really important. Um, we're thinking about how many, you know, and how many visits to clinic, for example, we should have people do. Um, they've been really an important voice. They've helped us really un align the unmet needs of patients and communities with researchers. They've helped us really think about endpoints and outcomes that are most meaningful to them. Um, we have been thinking, as I mentioned, about how can we make things least burdensome as far as procedures, schedules, data collection, et cetera? How can we eliminate or decrease barriers to recruitment and participation? What about um, understanding around cultural beliefs and values and making sure that you have a diverse population, not only in the clinical trials, but we've been informed and have had diverse representation on the working groups, as well as the larger recover efforts, um, and then developing strategies for engagement and distribution of final um, you know, results to patient and community environments, because we want the information to be used um, when there is an opportunity. So the, um, the PASC platform protocols for clinical trials, they span a range of dominant symptom clusters and propose etiologic pathways. And I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit more detail a little bit later on. As I mentioned, um, we've solicited clinical trial concepts or the NIH solicited clinical trial concepts and potential interventions. And then we developed these five platform protocols. Um, the protocols span some major symptom clusters that have been identified particularly from the long cohort. Um, and we have developed the platform protocols as a way to be a little bit more efficient in how we're thinking about and executing clinical trials so that things can be tested more quickly and put away if they're not actually um, being successful or uh, have no likelihood of being successful. Um, there are a range of interventions, as you'll soon see, that they include drugs, biologics, devices, um, rehab, um, and complementary and integrative medicine approaches. So um, as I mentioned there, we believe there are some benefits to platform protocols um, and uh, having clinical trials that come out of this platform. We think that it's really important that we have an integrated structure for thinking about things like the central IRB or the DSNB, general trial oversight, data analysis, clinical sites, and then ability to long-term to follow up patients on, over the long-term. But there's also this idea of really functional integration. So by having these um, platform protocols by developing them at the same time. We can do things like make sure that we have shared endpoints. We have a similar approach to patient inclusion and exclusion where it's appropriate. We are able to benefit from the cross-disciplinary clinical expertise. We can use common data elements. Um, and we can also, you know, um, uh, get mechanist or do mechanistic studies so we can really understand more of the underlying pathophysiology, pathobiology that's driving the symptoms that we're seeing. I think this functional integration is actually really important because we know that we saw in the, the case presentation earlier, patients aren't presenting with just one thing so that there was one patient who had probably POTS or past POTS, but also, you know, had post-exertional malaise. So what can we learn from these clinical trials that might be targeted towards uh, POTS, past POTS, but also what do we learn about improvement of past POTS and how it affects post-exertional malaise, for example? So I think this is really, really key and really important and something that um, clinical or the patients have been really excited about. So there are five 
platform protocols. Um, one of them is really looking very closely at viral persistence, reactivation, and immune dysregulation. We have another that looks at neurologic or cognitive dysfunction, autonomic dysfunction, sleep disorders, and then cardiopulmonary exercise, intolerance, and um, fatigue. And then uh, a fifth that really is looking, oh yeah, I, I mentioned all of it, thanks. Um, many of you are familiar with all of these uh, kind of definitions, but when we're thinking about viral persistence, we are thinking about kind of uh, the virus that's, that causes COVID-19, stays in your body, reactivates or causes the immune system to overreact and wreaks havoc on your body. Autonomic dysfunction manifests in a number of different ways. Dizziness, fast heart rate. We saw lots of these symptoms in our case presentation today. Sleep disturbances could be changes to sleep patterns or ability to sleep. Cognitive dysfunction, brain fog has been the, the key characteristic of um, many people with uh, cognitive dysfunction, and then exercise intolerance and fatigue. So changes in a person's activity level or energy level that has, interferes with daily activities. On the one hand, this might be exercise intolerance, like while I'm doing the activity. On the other hand, or um, in some of the other trials, this may be closer defined as post-exertional malaise. So we're really thinking about things that may contribute in that particular situation. So these ideas, these symptom clusters have been um, uh, really thought about by lots and lots of people. And there have been five protocol working groups that have contributed um, their thoughts and their time to developing these protocols. Each of these platform protocols has had patient representatives, scientific experts in the symptom area, subject matter experts and the interventions in particular, investigators who submitted the interventions through this um, uh, uh, CT ROA process, and then representatives from their protocols to change them, um, to present to the DSMB, to send it to the IRB, et cetera. So in general, the, plat the platform protocols will cover, or the five trials, um, as the initial trials, will cover um, almost 3,000 participants. Recruitment will be site-based for each of these protocols. Each of these um, trials, the five initial trials, will include 25 to 100 sites, depending on which platform you're in. Some of the sites may participate in multiple trials, and um, we are very excited about enrollment um, forthcoming. So over the next couple of slides, I'll tell you a, a couple more details about the specific trials themselves or the platform. So viral persistence, as I mentioned, is the first platform that we're very excited about. We are interested in whether or not um, interventions such as antivirals, specifically things like Paxlovid, might improve outcomes in patients with ongoing symptoms from PASC. We are looking at about 900 participants here, and we are focusing in on three symptom clusters. So the three symptom clusters are exercise intolerance, really defined in this particular situation as post-exertional malaise. We are looking at cognitive um, dysfunction, and we are looking at autonomic dysfunction. Um, the intervention, as I mentioned, is antiviral drugs, at least to start, and the first will be um, Paxlovid versus control. We are looking at a variety of measures um, that are specifically focused in on patient-reported outcomes, but there are also some performance-based outcomes, and we're interested in safety and tolerability of using drugs like Paxlovid within this particular setting. There will be up to 100 sites um, for this particular trial, and we are very hopeful that we will hit um, uh, first patient enrollment by the end of July. So as cognitive dysfunction, we are um, looking at a number of interventions here in 315 adults with cognitive dysfunction related to PASC. The, the interventions are a variety of cognitive training um, measures. So there um, is, are things like transcranial direct current stimulation um, and used in combination with cognitive training um, or uh, um, other kind of rehab techniques. Um, again, really looking at patient reported outcomes, performance-based outcomes, and then safety and tolerability of these particular um, uh, interventions, particularly as they there, there are five arms in this particular trial and they're used these um, interventions are used in various combinations. So we up to 45 sites that'll participate in this particular trial. And we are very hopeful um, that July will be our target. Um, the end of July will be the target for the first patient enrolled in this particular trial as well. 
As far as sleep, um, we are looking at a couple of different sleep disorders. So um, the first will be looking at patients with hypersomnia after PASC. And then the second will be about 600 adults with something called complex PASC-related sleep disturbances, which may mean that they have circadian rhythm disorders that have contributed um, to their presentation or other types of sleep disorders, insomnia, for example. There's a host of pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic um, therapies that are being looked at here that specifically target hypersomnia and this idea of complex PASC-related sleep disturbances, um, similar health measures, up to 100 sites, and we are looking um, at the fall for the first patient in um, for this study. Autonomic dysfunction, looking specifically at PASC POTS, or about 400 patients with PASC POTS. Um, we are looking at immunotherapies, non-pharmacologic therapies that have been talked about earlier today, um, and also looking at things like um, uh, kind of like evabridine, for example, that would be um, potential treatments for past POTS and have shown some promise in early studies. Looking at similar patient-reported outcomes, performance-based outcomes, and safety and tolerability of these particular interventions in up to 75 sites, we're hopeful that fall, will, fall winter will be the launch for this particular um, trial or platform. And then finally, exercise intolerance and fatigue. Um, I, you've heard some about the controversy that has been stated today. Um, you know, should people exercise? Should they not? In what circumstances, et cetera? And so um, really thinking, this is very much under development, really thinking very carefully about the particular population that should be part of this trial, thinking about whether or not um, things like pacing really need to be further evaluated. Um, uh, as as part of, of a trial, for example, um, and then having things like patient-reported outcomes, performance-based outcome measures like the shuttle walk um, that would really um, evaluate endurance of these particular patients. The safety of this, so does, um, you know, does cardiopulmonary have, for example, induced post-exertional um, malaise in underwear circumstances? Can we control it? Those types of things are really being thought very carefully about. And this will be done in up to 50 sites, we think, um, but still really thinking through this protocol in particular. All right, um, that I'm happy to take questions. And I see I was freezing during some of that. Oh, you were you were great. And, uh, and that was a lot of information, a lot of very useful information. Again, you know, as we saw from the beginning of the, of the, the, this webinar, when we ask the questions, a lot of people don't know about Recover. A lot of people don't know about the resources and what Recover is doing. I think we're beginning to see some papers, but I think the clinical trials, and I emphasize to people, you know, if you don't have a Recover site next to you, try to find one. And if you do, definitely it's a good opportunity to refer uh, patients and to refer, you know, people for clinical trials, because this is where we're going to get a lot of the answers. So there's a, there's a lot of questions that come up uh, you know, some of them have to do with 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 with, uh, with still with vaccines and other topics, and I'll bring them up, and you tell me if you want to answer answer them, or if we have somebody else answer them. Uh, you know, is there interest in including patients from other countries into into recovery? Are we? I started to think about the ACTG. We started in the U.S. and then it became very international, right? Yeah, the initial. Um... The initial focus of recover is really going to be in the U.S. Um, there are, as you, as we have seen today, lots and lots and lots of patients who potentially could benefit from um, interventions even here in the U.S. and really not that many slots um, within the clinical trial. So the initial, the initial focus is going to be um, on the U.S. and trying to, to focus there. But uh, who knows what will happen in the future? I think the adaptive clinical trials platform and approach is a very useful one and a very interesting one for this kind of approaches when we really don't, I mean, to me, a lot of the challenges is we don't really understand the pathogenesis and the pathophysiology, and it's really hard to think. I think we're in a, in a way, you know, batting blindly at this point in time. 100% agree with that. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons that we've um, done it. I mean, we are, or we develop it in this way. We are we are building a plane and flying it at the same time, but it allows us to do that hopefully in an efficient way. So tell me, what, somebody's asking questions. Hey, Judy, somebody's asking a question about monitoring or repleting vitamin D in the treatment of, of, of long COVID. Has that been looked at? 
I'm happy to have other people answer if they would like. Um, there, you know, there are a host of things that people have tried. We really tried to, we, not we really, but there were, you know, the, the prioritization groups really tried to focus in on um, things that had preliminary evidence that could be widely available that, um, yeah, those were some of the major criteria. So I can, were I, can tell you, I, I can tell you that I was part of the committee who met almost weekly reviewing drugs and potential therapeutics and 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 really looking at is there any evidence, clinical evidence, is there, you know, possibility does this work, does this not work? And it was really hard, right? And uh, and a lot of things were proposed there. I mean, we went through hundreds of drugs trying to figure out what to do. And the reality, as I said, is, is very frustrating because you really don't know where to start. And, but that's how we started in HIV. You know, we were, if I show you some of the initial HIV trials, they don't look like what we're doing right now. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question about that. I think it's, we're in such a difficult situation because we have so many people experiencing this really debilitating condition. We absolutely need these trials, but we also, I think, and then there's people trying all these things on their own, right, with their physicians in practice. And, and I think making sure that we have um, systems in place to capture the evidence that is coming out of practice. And while it may not be the gold standard or the absolute thing, I think expecting people to just sit by, <laughs> you know, as we heard from Dr. Spiegel in the beginning it, um, and wait three years for the answers, um, it's, it's really challenging. So I think thinking creatively, and this, I know this isn't your job, you guys have your hands full with these clinical trials, but what are your thoughts about how we can generate evidence from other you know, other areas that to supplement what we're going to learn from the clinical trials. Yeah, I think it's absolutely necessary. I think this is one of the places where things like EMR could be, you know, totally beneficial. It's also one of the reasons that we've been pretty broad in the populations that we've included in clinical trials. So we can, you know, understand, are you taking a stimulant? Yes, you can still be in the trial. Let's understand how that stimulant might also affect how things are going. So I think there's many opportunities all around. So a couple of questions, and again, you know, Judy, you and anybody could answer is really, are there any useful markers that general internists can use to diagnose or support diagnosis of long COVID? You know, people have talked about CMP, people have talked about the dimer, uh, about serum spike antigen, anything that, that you are using and recover to say this person has long COVID. That's part of that's part of the the loveliness here. And then, you know, part of the um, trials is to try to get some mechanistic information, so blood and stool and nasal swabs, et cetera, so that we can identify biomarkers that could be used in the future for diagnosing long COVID. You know, um, Dr. Zimmerman, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on your expertise as a pediatrician here, just to make the comment. We haven't talked about kids at all today. But what are your thoughts about long COVID in children and where do they fit into this um, research agenda? Yeah, the it's certainly equally important, right? To think about children. I'm always gonna say that as a pediatrician. Um, there are, you know, the number of people who've come up to me to say like, we are suffering, we need something. There are even fewer, even clinics that will see children um, with long COVID um, or even have any expertise. You think about development, right? And how, like, if you can't concentrate, you can't necessarily go to school. If you're too tired, you can't go to school. And those are all really critical things for like your future life. Um, so kids are a part of recover in general, like there is a, a pediatric cohort. Um, there are plans for clinical trials um, for kid, children, but it's down the road. So I'm hopeful that we'll get there soon. Great. So somebody asked the question that it's already kind of been answered, but I just want to throw it back in again, is, you know, what do we know about, about the benefits of treating with Paxlovid in decreasing the risk of long COVID? And what do we know about the benefits of vaccination? Yeah, Judy, I don't know if you want to take some take some of that as well. <laughs> I mean, I think that we talked about the Paxlovid data and the EMR data, and I think we really need more data from randomized clinical trials to uh, address this question of, of people who um, are followed from the time they're diagnosed with COVID to see um, what their longer term um, outcomes are in terms of that. But, um, you know, I think it certainly makes 
sense physiologically and from what Dr. Parady shared with us about the pathophysiology that more effective treatment of the virus early in the course of disease could prevent this cascading of events that seem to, you know, to seem to happen. So I, I, I certainly think there's reason to believe and reason to think about using treatment in somebody who might not otherwise qualify for it. Um, I think here's an important question that says, there seem to be patients who are attributing the COVID vaccine as a trigger for long COVID symptoms. What information do we have for this? Is there a mechanism to explain this? And I will just quickly say there's nothing to suggest that and there's no mechanism to explain that. And that that I think again is is unfortunate because you know it's again feeding into the the the, the you know sort of the myth that vaccines don't work and vaccines are bad and vaccines clearly decrease mortality, decrease hospitalization, they probably decrease the risk of long COVID, they decrease the risk of infection. So vaccines are much better, and no, they don't. They don't have. There's no evidence that they actually trigger long COVID. And unless anybody else has anything different or heard anything different, uh, so how about data on zinc? I'm not aware of any specific data on zinc, um, but there have, I think a number of people have said today, like a number of supplements and things like that that are being tried um, in clinics. They are being um, you know, tried in just general long COVID communities, um, but I'm not aware of like specific data on zinc. So somebody's asking, how do we refer patients to the upcoming clinical trials? Is there a list of sites? I'll let you answer, but I would say, please go to the Recover website. Yep, absolutely. There's um, a lot, a lot of sites across the country. NIH yeah. made NIH made the point to really put them across across the country. Yeah, and can you clarify the studies are are going to be open to people who haven't already been in the recover cohort, or are they going to be limited to people who've been characterized through that? I think that's important for people to know. Yeah, there will be sites who are in the recover cohort. And there are sites who are not in the recover cohort. So people who have not been already characterized or participating already can still participate in these particular trials. Well, I think there's a lot of really useful information. And again, you know, a lot of we don't know, but that's what we are good at, right? Uh, that's what we are scientists and, and researchers and we start with 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 unknowns and we get to answers and we do it through scientific method and we do it through uh, research basic science and we do it through clinical trials and I think I'm very excited about the way this is being put together because at the end of the day I think we're going to get a lot of the answers to questions that today we have no answers to Any any closing remarks? I, I would just say that I you know I think that it's been a tremendous effort, and I know Kanisha has played a really leadership role. And there's I think the people that are trying to move these trials forward are really trying very hard to move them forward as quickly as they can. And you know it's just not it's never fast enough. And so I, I really hope that as they open in the next few months, they can enroll quickly with the support of of people you know in the community so that we can get the answers. So. It's, it's really been an all hands on deck kind of effort. Yeah, I know, I, I agree with that. And again, I agree and I also say, uh, uh, Kanisha, I'm, I'm very excited that you and others are leading this because I always worry that we're gonna have a low representation of underrepresented minorities, right? And, and we wanna make sure that we don't forget that this disease disproportionately impacted black and brown people. And we need to be sure that they're also included in the clinical trials. Absolutely, such an important point. So thank you very much. Any any closing remarks at this point in time? I think really we have a couple closing Go, oh, Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, I'm really excited to get started. I'm hopeful that we'll have the support of people on this um, call as well as others as we are trying to enroll patients and, and moving things forward. So.